Hello YouTube, Sidekick here in my trusty T45 Gosshawk. Just making some final uh, selections of nav frequencies here. We got 107 X-ray on the TAC end. We're going to put 114.3 on the VOR. Uh, so we are on the ground at Larnaca in Cyprus as we get the multifunction displays set up. And uh, once we're uh, all configured here and we start taxiing out to the runway, uh, I'll give you a little bit of a briefing about what we're looking at today. So we're going out on an instrument training flight today. As I said, we're leaving from Larnaca, uh, which is here. And we are departing to the east. And we're going to climb out. And... Then we are going to do a VOR approach to Gesset Kale. I'm not sure if that's how you say that. I apologize for anybody who knows how to say it right. We're going to descend through the clouds. We're going to do a little bit of sightseeing along the northern ridge of Cyprus. And then we're going to do a TACAN approach and a DME circle around Akrotiri until we get to the uh, ILS approach to the runway. And then we're going to use ILS to approach the runway. Okay, so what does a DME circle mean? It basically means that we're going to uh, approach Akrotiri until we're um, at the range we want, which is about 12 nautical miles, as you can see on the map. And then we're going to try to go around Akrotiri at 12 nautical miles away, decreasing our altitude to 4,000 feet, and we want to arrive at the top of the ILS uh, feather there at about 4,000 feet at 12 nautical miles. Uh, for the details of the navigation, here's the frequencies as you can see we've dialed up the 107 x-ray TACAN and we've also dialed up the VOR at 114.3. Uh, once we get airborne we're going to have to uh, set our course uh, for our first um, fix there at 345 degrees and we're going to practice approaching at 345. So that's the plan for today. We're just uh, working our way out here to the runway in our T45. Now part of the reason that I decided to do this in Cyprus. Uh, I did a little video about uh, the comparison of the T-45 in DCS and Microsoft Flight Simulator a while back. Um, did it in the Caucasus and some folks mentioned that uh, the terrain in DCS in Cyprus might compare a little bit better to the Microsoft Flight Simulator terrain. So we're going to do a, a flight in the DCS version of the T-45 today and then uh, Hopefully in a little while I'm going to do a very similar mission using the Microsoft Flight Simulator version of the T-45 and also do some, some instrument flying and also in Cyprus so we can compare them a little bit more directly. So you can look forward to that. Keep an eye out in the next few days. If you aren't already subscribed to the channel, you should do that too. Alright, we're getting ourselves out to the runway here. Just uh, take a minute here, get ourselves lined up, and we'll get off on this instrument nav training mission. Get ourselves centered up on the runway here. Just a little bit further. All right, flaps are set, and I think we can just roll it on out. Uh, uh, getting a bit better at keeping these things straight down the runway, and time to rotate, and we're off the ground, gear up. And flaps up. And we're off on our training mission. So you can see we've got clouds set around 8,000 feet. So uh, if you were looking at the altitudes there on the, the training plan, we're going to be flying above the clouds for a lot of this. So we will actually be doing instrument flying. We won't be able to see the ground. So the T-45 has essentially three navigation systems. You've got um, the TACAN and the VOR that we're going to use but it also has an inertial nav system. Um, so it will actually take the uh, points in your flight plan um, that you put in the mission editor and it will also use those 
um, as opposed to having to use the actual navigation aids. So the first navigation aid we're going to use is the VOR. If you want to know more about a VOR, I did do a video about navigation aids um, and the A4 a little while back, so you can go back and take a look at that video. Uh, VOR stands for Very High Frequency Omni Ranging, and it's basically a beacon that allows us to navigate towards us, um, but it will tell us what direction we are coming in on, so we can approach it in the direction that we want to. You can see that the VOR is already showing up on our right hand multifunction display. Um, we're getting some numbers there um, on the, it's the second set of numbers there on the left hand side. So we, we, are, um, we are hearing the VOR uh, at Guess at Kale. And uh, in a minute here, once we have actually reached our climb out altitude, we're going to switch over to nav with the VOR. So before we do that, let's get our course radial dialed up here. And so we press course, and in three, four, five, we see it on the upfront display, hit enter, and now it shows up on the multifunction display down in the right hand corner. And now when we click on the course deviation indicator, CDI, um, we get the standard CDI display that tells us essentially how far we are off the track down that radial. And uh, it's saying we need to continue flying the direction we are. We need to stay to the right, uh, which is the direction we're heading. So we're going to keep doing that. We're going to level off a little bit. Now you can see the needle is, uh, the break in the needle is starting to come in, which means we're getting close to being on the radial, so we should turn to the left towards the target. So we're going to try and time our turn so we get the arrow at the top when the line comes together. You can also see in all of this that I have selected the VOR on the multifunction display, so it's now uh, the data that's being fed to the HUD. Okay, so we've ended up just a little bit to the left of where we want to be. The CDI is telling us to fly a little to the right, of course, to get back onto our 345 degree radial, so that's what we'll do. And once again, the needle starts to come in, so we turn back to the right try to synchronize it so we're getting the straight needle at the same time as we get the needle pointing to the top of the graph. Now because this is actually just a VOR and not a VOR DME, distance measuring equipment, we're not getting a range at this point, we're just getting a direction. We'll know when we have passed the target though, um, when we start to see rapid fluctuations in the, the bearing to the VOR and then ultimately it will flip to the reciprocal and we'll know that we've passed it. We can also look at the flight plan point um, and the inertial nav will also give us some idea of how close we are. So drifted a little bit, never did get all the way over so we're just trying to get that heading cleaned up. Now bear in mind that that needle deflection, the full deflection is something like two nautical miles so we're not really that far off course at this point. That looks about right, so we're just trimming right back on to flying towards the VOR. And we're just sticking to here a little bit under 12,000 feet. And at around 90%, a little bit more, more than 90% power, that gives us about 300 knots. Oops, we've drifted a little to the right again. Uh, the CDI is, is actually quite okay. Now you can see actually what's happening as we're approaching the target because you can see that uh, the CDI is moving off. In a minute here, we're going to see it uh, flip directions. And then we'll be on to our next waypoint. So, in fact, we'll go back to waypoint nav, inertial nav, and we're going to head for the north coast and we're going to start descending here soon so we can get down through the clouds to do a little bit of sightseeing. This will give us a chance to take in the Cyprus coast, which uh, I think is a good suggestion to actually get out of the Caucasus. It's definitely true that the Syria map uh, is much more impressive terrain than the Caucasus. It's, it's much newer, so that's not really all that surprising. Um, but also Cyprus is a particularly, um, particularly stunning part of the Syria map, so that's partly why I decided to fly here, so we can take a look at the scenery. Coming back down through the clouds here, cloud deck here again. And you can see from the right MFD that we're coming up on our uh, 
on our inertial nav point, which is really just on the other side of the ridge here on the north side of the island. So we're just kind of drifting down here to something around. We'll probably, we were scheduled for 4,000 feet, but you know what, I think we'll go take a closer look at things. Get down nice and low, take a look at what Cyprus looks like in DCS. Buzzing the ridge top here. And we'll take a little turn and fly up the coast. Now we are keeping an eye on the uh, the MFD again and on the inertial nav because uh, waypoint four we're going to want to climb up again. And uh, once we get high enough, we'll reestablish contact with the TAC end that we've lost because we're down too low. And when we see the TAC end, we're going to turn into the TAC end and get ready to do our DME circle and our instrument landing. But in the meantime, do some sightseeing. definitely true that this is a very nice DCS map. We'll see how it compares to the Microsoft Flight Simulator when we do that uh, video, hopefully uh, in the next little while. And this is definitely a very scenic area of the Cypress Coast. If you haven't, if you have this area map and you've never gone out to take a look, you really should do that. And we're just flying along the coast here, waiting until we get a little bit closer to waypoint four so we can climb back up above the cloud deck and then we'll start our instrument procedures to take us to Akrotiri. So I find this is really interesting to be able to compare two jets as carefully um, as you can with the T-45 between DCS and Microsoft Flight Simulator. If you haven't checked out my earlier video on parallel universes, you can do that as well. Um, it's proving to be pretty interesting, actually. The the uh, T-45 in Microsoft Flight Simulator is well done, and of course this T-45 in DCS, which is a free download, um, is also very well done. Um, now the T-45 in Microsoft Flight Simulator had a little issue with uh, Sim Update 7, but that's now been fixed, and as part of that uh, actually, they've corrected one of the major issues with that model, which is that the HUD is now collimated. So I'm looking forward to uh, taking out and uh, ringing it out a little bit. And again, hopefully we'll have that video out fairly soon. So we've reached or nearly reached waypoint four. So we're heading back to altitude. We want to get through the clouds. And we also want to look at that TACN, TCN uh, note there on the top left of the right-hand multifunction display. We want to start seeing numbers there, which will indicate that we're back in contact with the TACAN. And we're getting up through the cloud deck here. And there's the TACAN right on schedule. So get through the clouds, and then we're going to start our TACAN navigation once we get leveled off here. Okay, so we select TACAN. Now it's the one that's being showed on the HUD, and we get a distance, which is now it's uh, well over 40 nautical miles, so we've got ways to go before we start our DME circle. And now we just need to turn directly towards the TAC and signal. We'll get a cue for that. We'll see that on the multifunction display, and you can also see the vertical line coming in on the HUD, and we're basically going to try and put our little coarse carrot over top of that vertical line and then we'll be flying directly at the tack end right around there. And now it's just a matter of counting down the, uh, the miles here. Uh, one thing we do want to put our course in which I've just done and that's in this case the course is actually uh, the orientation of the runway which is 280. So we'll be landing on runway 28. Now we're set up for that. So we just need the, the distance to count down. We're going to try and do the DME circle at around 12 nautical miles because that's the uh, takes us sort of the, to the tip of the ILS uh, glide slope. 
we're probably going to start descending at around 20 nautical miles. Oh, and the other thing we have to do is we have to dial up the frequency for the ILS, which is 109.7. And there we go. And now we actually see on the multifunction display that we have an ILS indication on in the second slot there below TAC end. So we are hearing the ILS. We won't be flipping to it until we're ready to, to start our landing approach, though. So as I was saying, at around 20 nautical miles, we'll probably start our descent. Probably at around 15 nautical miles, we'll start um, turning to the left to start the DME circle uh, with the idea that eventually we're going to stabilize at 12 nautical miles and try to go around the station, keeping as close as we can to 12 nautical miles. Let's see how well I do that today. All right, it's looking pretty good. Counting down the miles here. So once again, we can't see the target, although we can see where it is with this level of cloud. So, uh, you know, we're not needing to do instrument approaches today, but um, we probably certainly couldn't be as accurate as we're going to be without instruments here. So once again, we're just trying to fly straight towards the tack in, and we're just letting the distance drop so we can get close enough to start our procedures here. Okay, there we are. We are down under, or just approaching 30 nautical miles, so still a uh, little ways before we need to start our descent. Um, as a reminder, we're going to try and get down to 4,000 feet when we get around to the tip of the ILS um, approach which will be uh, obviously out to the east of the airport because we're coming in from the west. So I'm hoping to continue doing uh, these kinds of videos where I compare the T-45 and Microsoft Flight Simulator and DCS if you have some ideas of what comparisons you'd like to see or even what other maps we should use. I think probably be interesting to go out and take a look at the Marianas map actually. Maybe we'll do that one next. I'm sure that there have been T-45s on the Marianas at one point or another. Go take a look at that maybe. Alright, how are we doing? Still a little ways to go yet. But we're going to want to start descending here fairly soon. And then as I said, we're going to start our turn to the left um, to start our DME circle. So as you can see, the other thing we've done is we've we've got the uh, the right multifunction display back in CDI mode. Uh, it's not a big deal right now, but as we get closer to getting on bearing, uh, we'll start paying a little bit more attention to that. All right, coming up on 21 nautical miles. Pretty soon, time to start our descent. And as I said, we're just going to try and manage our height so that we get down to 4,000 feet when we're ready to start our approach. So we'll back off the power, start downhill now. And we're also watching the distance close up. And somewhere around 15, we're going to start that slow turn to the right. And essentially what we want to do is we want to get the tack end station off our right wing tip at a distance of 12 nautical miles and then try to keep it there. And it takes a little bit of practice to do that. We'll see how well I do today. Okay, coming down through the clouds and coming down to 15. And we're going to start turning. And you can see the tack end there at the top of the right multifunction display and it's rotating around to the right and as I said I want to try and get it off my right wingtip so to the right at around the time that I get the distance down to 12 so the distance is coming down through 13 it's coming around to the right altitude still coming down we're trying to manage all of this at the same time 12 and a half Maybe slow the turn a little bit. 
So in general, if you have the tack end in front of the horizontal line, you'll be getting closer to it. If you have it behind the horizontal line, you'll be getting farther away from it. So that's how we're going to try and manage our distance. So we're not doing too bad. 12.3, 12.2, it's pretty much where we want it off the right hand side now. And now it's just a matter of waiting for the desired course line, the arrow, to basically come up to the tack end station. And when it does that, um, we know we'll be getting close to the uh, radial that we want to come in on. And it'll be time to turn in. And then once we do that, it'll be time to turn on the ILS. So just a matter of trying to jockey, keep it around 12 nautical miles. And at the same time, keep coming around and keep coming around. We're getting a little farther away. Time to turn a little bit. As you can see, we're getting farther away because the tack is just a little bit astern of a beam. So now we want to bring it back to beam, maybe even a little ahead of beam. And that means we'll keep coming around. You can see the course arrow is starting to come up to the tack end station now. To manage our height, we're getting close to where we want to be. And start watching the height. Speed is good. We want speed at around 200 knots. Don't want to get too far under 200 knots. Because once we turn in, then we're going to open the uh, spoilers and then we're going to drop the gear in the flap. So we're 200 knots, a little bit more than 4,000 feet, right around 12 nautical miles, and the target is a beam. Oops, we're getting a little close. Bear off just a little bit here. And we're coming around. A little bit further to go now. Try not to lose too much altitude or too much speed. Okay, now we're going away from the target a little, so we'll turn in. Just a matter of trying to juggle all those numbers now. And we're coming around. Now we can start looking for the target. A little bit more than 4,000 feet, around 200 knots. Target's a beam at 12.2 nautical miles. And we're getting in pretty close. We're down to the last 10 or 15 degrees here. So pretty soon we're going to see the CDI needle start to come together and then we're really going to want to turn in hard at that point. It's coming up. We're staying around 12 nautical miles. Maybe turn in just a little bit. And it's coming up. Needle's coming up to the tack end station. Just keep working it around. 4,000 feet, 200 knots, pretty good. But 80% power. Alright, almost there. Needle's almost over the tack end now. And need, now the CDI needle's starting to come together. It's time to start turning it in. So we want to bring the needle in the tack end station right to the top of the dial. And then it'll be time to start setting up for our ILS approach. We use the ILS because the tack end station, especially here at Akrotiri, the tack end station is not actually uh, directly on the runway. So now I have clicked ILS, so now we're going to be using ILS. We see a vertical line to the left of the flight path vector on the screen, and that's what I'm going to be using now rather than the CDI. And it's saying that we're to the right, so we need to keep flying a bit around to the left before we turn in all the way. And now it's coming into the middle, so we're going to want to turn to the right to try and keep it in the middle. Looks like we're good on glide slope, but we're not doing anything about that right now. Getting the spoilers out. And then we'll get the gear down and the flaps down. just a sec. So we're good on glide slope. We're lined up now. Now I can see the runway so I can be using that as a visual reference as well. Speed's coming down a little with the spoilers.
Glide slope's good. Speed's coming down. Flight path vectors on target. We're lined up. This is looking good. And so now it's time to get the gear down and the flaps down. Now we want to get the flight path vector in the staple and get the flight path vector over the runway and try and stay on glide slope too. We're trying to manage all of those things. We're just trimming ourselves up slowly, trying to get the flight path vector up into the staple. Once it's there, we're going to manage our attitude with power now. Once we get the once we get the angle of attack indicator in the middle, now we're managing our attitude with power. So if we want to get the flight path vector up, we add a bit of power. If we want to let it come back down, we just subtract a bit of power. Try not to be moving on the stick, just trying to manage it all with power. And we're keeping the runway in sight. We're down the middle of the runway. And we're on glide slope. We get the cross right in the middle of our flight path vector. That's where we want it to be. Now it's just a matter of jockeying the power. Up and back, up and back. Trying to keep that flight path vector over the end of the runway. Looking good so far. A little bit of jockey in here. Took a good approach. Right in the middle. Just keep jockeying the power smoothly here. Stay in the middle. Keep everything lined up. I realized I misspoke a little while ago. I referred to them as spoilers. I should have called them speed brakes. My apologies. Just looking at the like, green light there. All right, we're good. Coming in on line, coming in on glide slope. Flight path vectors on the runway. AOA is in the middle. Just keep it coming down nice and smooth. We're in the middle, AOA is in the middle. Flight path vectors on the runway. And it looks like we're right on the numbers here. And just a tiny bit of a flare. And we're down. And now easy on the brakes to keep from skidding. And we are safe and sound at Akrotiri. Well, I hope you enjoyed that uh, little instrument nav and sightseeing trip around Cyprus. Hopefully it gives you some ideas of what to do in your own practice. Do stay tuned for the next uh, video where we'll do a similar exercise in Microsoft Flight Simulator so we can do a bit more of a direct comparison. And by all means, if you like the video, please give it a like. And if you like the channel, please do subscribe. And I think for now, that is going to be Sidekick. Signing off.